Welcome to Tactical Talk, this is Zan Khan. The execution of Sheikh Nimr took the world by surprise. With the Saudi Iranian tensions growing, the ripple effect of their collision is being felt within all the Muslim world. To discuss the Saudi Iranian tension and its global impact, we have with us today Kamran Bukhari. Kamran Bukhari is a Middle East and South Asia specialist at the University of Ottawa and fellow with the program on extremism at George Washington University's uh, Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. He is also the former advisor to the US intelligence firm Stratfor and the author of Political Islam in the Age of Democratization. Welcome to our show, Kamran Bukhari. This is Zan Khan. Thank you for having me on the show, Zan. Uh, Kamran, uh, starting with the first question, what led to the recent escalation in Saudi-Iranian tensions? Zain, as you know, that the Saudis and the Iranians have been at odds ever since the founding of the Islamic Republic in 1979. Uh, during the first decade uh, in the 80s, the Saudis uh, had the situation contained because of the war between Iraq and Iran and the Iraq, uh, Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein at the time served as a buffer between Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and the threat from an expanding Iran at the time. Uh, but, you know, by the end of that decade uh, and, and the beginning of the 90s, uh, Iraq went from being uh, an ally against Iran to an opponent for the Saudis and, and, and its Khaliji allies because of the invasion of Kuwait. And we had the 1991 Gulf War which resulted in the weakening of the Iraqi state. Uh, and then of course, 12 years of sanctions after that further deteriorated the, the ability of the uh, Iraqi government to serve as a buffer uh, and to protect uh, or insulate the Saudis and the, and the Khalijis from Iran. Uh, and by 2003, post 9-11, uh, we saw that uh, the fall of Saddam's uh, government really was a game changer for the Saudis and, and, and the Saudis for the first time felt extremely vulnerable because A, uh, there was a divergence of interests between that of Riyadh and of Washington, uh, most clearly manifested in the toppling of the Saddam regime, and, and the fact that the Iranians and the Americans were cooperating, not just in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq, despite the nuclear issue, also was a cause of concern for the Saudis. Um, and if you fast forward to uh, 2011, Arab Spring, and when the collapse of the Arab states around Saudi Arabia was taking place, naturally the Saudis felt more vulnerable and, and they knew that Iran would have more space uh, to intervene in what it considers uh, collective Arab security, for which it was responsible by then and continues to be. And now with the nuclear agreement, uh, you know, th this is almost like a nightmare scenario for the Saudis because uh, their biggest ally, the United States, uh, is, in, on a pro, pro, is involved in a process towards detente with its biggest enemy, Iran. Uh, Kamran, second question. Uh, who was the Shiite cleric Sheikh al-Nimr and why did his execution become the trigger for a major spike in an ongoing geopolitical conflict between Saudi and Iran? Then Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr uh, is basically the most radical Shiite cleric in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, Saudi Shia clergy, some of whom are moderate, uh, some of whom are centrist. Uh, but Sheikh Nimr was really uh, one of the most uh, prominent radicals who was uh, bitterly opposed to the rule of Allah Saud uh, and uh, was placed, positioning himself as a champion of, of the Saudi Shia. Uh, obviously, this is a problem for the Saudis uh, and, and, and a security concern. Uh, so they were, they were trying to uh, suppress him uh, and his call and, and his uh, ability to mobilize uh, people against the regime. And about three years ago in 2013, I believe, he was arrested finally after a gun battle uh, in the eastern province. Uh, and, and since then he was in custody uh, and he was pretty much, you know, taken off the battlefield, as we say, you know, in military terms. Uh, he wasn't really a threat and, 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 and there wasn't a public uprising uh, and that, you know, in the wake of his arrest and, and incarceration. He, he had been sentenced to death uh, and he was on death row. Uh, his timing, the timing of his execution uh, around New Year's uh, was very telling uh, in the sense that he, he didn't have to be executed then. 
Uh, and, I mean, he could have stayed on death row for quite a while. The decision of the Saudis to execute him, along with 40-some other, mostly al-Qaeda jihadists, uh, you know, was a Saudi attempt at sending a message. Uh, the first message was to Iran that uh, the Saudis are not going to allow Iran to intrude upon uh, Arab space, and especially not Saudi uh, domestic affairs. Uh, and by executing the Shia uh, cleric, uh, the Saudis were sending a message to the Iranians. Uh, secondly, by executing him at the same time as they executed uh, jihadists from al-Qaeda, they were sending a message to the world that the Saudi regime does not distinguish between uh, Daesh, i.e. ISIS, al-Qaeda, and dissident Shiites or pro-Iranian Shiite elements. They, the, the Saudis were saying we consider all of them uh, as enemies of the state and enemies of uh, Arab and regional security. And, and they were putting Iran uh, on notice as well, as I mentioned earlier. So this was basically very well timed. And obviously things got out of hand uh, with the, uh, the, the torching of the embassy, of the Saudi embassy in, in, in the Iranian capital, which led to the Iranian snapping, I'm sorry, the Saudi snapping diplomatic ties, and now we're, uh, you know, Saudi-Iranian tensions are at an all-time high, and, and, and that has real serious repercussions for regional security at a time when the region has no shortage of, of commotion and chaos. Uh, Kamran, are these two regional rivals on a collision course towards a straight-out war? Uh, in any case, what are the repercussions for the Middle East and wider Muslim world? I don't think that the Saudis and the Iranians are necessarily on a collision course uh, whose uh, outcome would be a direct war between the two regional rivals. And, and there are a number of reasons for that. The first being that uh, neither side is capable of uh, a, a direct conflict in militarily. I mean, they, they, they're both weak in their own respects. Uh, and then the geopolitical conditions in which they operate uh, essentially make this a very cost prohibitive uh, uh, policy option. Uh, number one, uh, you know, if you look at the Saudis, uh, they are dealing with uh, a lot of chaos uh, in the uh, Arab world, uh, and they're really fighting on many fronts. You know, they have Syria, they have Yemen already, uh, they're, then they're uh, dealing with Iraq, where, where Iran has the upper hand, they're also dealing with Lebanon. Uh, the weakening of Egypt, and so on and so forth. And, 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 and so I don't think that the Saudis would want a war with Iran. Uh, conversely, the Iranians don't want a war either at this point. And the reason for that is because the Iranians are, have just embarked upon a path towards international rehabilitation. Uh, they don't want uh, to uh, be seen as an aggressive power uh, and especially at a time when sanctions just got lifted. In fact, the sanctions process, the, I'm sorry, the process of sanctions respite has just gotten underway. Uh, the, the Iranians don't want to reverse the gains that they have made uh, and, and therefore are not really interested in a war. But, you know, subjective views uh, and sub uh, subjective perspectives on what a particular state and or non-state actor may want uh, may not necessarily jive with, uh, you know, objective geopolitical realities. The reality is that there's been a, a major escalation in their historic tensions, and uh, that raises the possibility of miscalculation when both sides are escalating uh, and engaging in bellicose rhetoric. Uh, and this is not just the Saudis and the Iranians. This isn't, it could be applied to any case around the world uh, and, you know, at and, and any point in time in history that when two sides are engaged in ratchet up, you know, this aggressive posturing, uh, there's issue of perception and misperception. And misperceptions uh, on, one, on the part of one or both could lead to an outcome where they may clash. Uh, we may want to call that a war or a small skirmish or, you know, a mini war. Uh, that may happen, but I do not think that they, either side can afford to fight a direct war, a prolonged, sustained one, uh, especially because you know oil prices are are down, and you know the economy is is is, is in shambles on both sides. The Saudis are declining uh, because of the low oil prices and their increasing domestic and foreign policy obligations, and Iran is just trying to limp back 
to uh, you know, economic stability after a long period of sanctions. Uh, that said, I think that they will escalate in the proxy war that will take place in various theaters. Uh, you know, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, and even third countries. Um, and unfortunately, Pakistan may be one of them. Uh, Kamran, which countries will be impacted the most in this uh, aggravation in Saudi Arabian tensions, and what does it mean for Pakistan? So, as I just mentioned, Zain, you know, the, because the possibility of a direct war is so low, uh, and because the tensions are not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, we're going to be seeing these two rivals slug it out uh, in third countries. And, and we're already seeing it uh, take place mostly in Syria. And there's a reason for that. It's because from the Saudi point of view, uh, if the regime of President Bashar al-Assad can be toppled, uh, then that would amount to the Saudis having punched a major hole in the Iranian sphere of influence, uh, and, and one that could really threaten Iranian interests in Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, and even uh, render vulnerable the Iranian position in Iraq. Uh, so there's a historic opportunity that the Saudis don't want to pass up, and therefore they're going to throw whatever they have, including the kitchen sink, into Syria. Likewise for Iran, uh, the, the toppling of the Assad regime. I'm not saying that that is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, Assad seems to be fairly uh, in control of the situation uh, at, at present, and I don't see uh, any correlation forces that can, can reverse that. But, you know, uh, but then again, these, there's a great degree of uncertainty in that country. Nonetheless, from the Iranian point of view, it's, uh, it is a, an intolerable national and regional security threat if uh, the uh, Assad regime were to be toppled or severely weakened uh, and, and rendered into just another militia in the country. And so uh, the Iranians are not going to back off either. So they're, we're going to see these two, you know, uh, try to deliver, you know, as many heavy punches to each other as possible there. Uh, in Iraq, it's, it's less likely because uh, the Sunnis of Iraq uh, are largely dominated by ISIS, which is not a, an ally of the Saudis. You know, the Saudis are fighting ISIS at the same time they're fighting the Iranians. Uh, and so that, that creates complications. Yemen is really sucking the Saudi resources, uh, and that's another place. But then again, uh, despite the hype, uh, I don't think that the Iranians are able to support the Houthis to the extent that you know, is popularly uh, perceived because Yemen is in the backyard of Saudi Arabia and logistically too far from uh, Iran. And so I, I think these are the two theaters, Yemen uh, to the south, uh, Syria to the north of Saudi Arabia, where we will see this proxy war play out. But as I mentioned, uh, you know, Pakistan is another place. Obviously, we don't have militias in Pakistan. Uh, but nonetheless, both uh, sides have influence in the country in their, you know, respective uh, fellow co-sectarians, uh, the Shia and the Sunni of Pakistan, especially, you know, the more militant organizations on both sides of the sectarian divide. And, and that's, that's, you know, not good news for Pakistan, because Pakistan, is, again, is just trying to really put behind uh, the, its, its sort of, you know, experience with the jihadist groups. Uh, over the last several decades, uh, Zabi Az is in motion, and you know they, they, there's been a lot of gains made, but there's a lot of work ahead, and that would be really, really destabilizing for the Pakistani strategy uh, should the Saudis uh, and the Iranians decide that they're going to uh, basically throw each other's pro uh, their respective proxies uh, against each other. Um, Kamran, where do you see the world powers, the United States, Europe, Russia, and China uh, tilting towards? As far as the international stakeholders uh, who have an interest in the region, and especially the Saudi-Iranian uh, rivalry, and, and which connects to other interests that world powers have in the region, especially as it concerns ISIS, the United States obviously tops the list of those players. And, and the U.S. strategy uh, has been that uh, it's not going to take a lead role, it's not going to intervene militarily uh, in any country as it did in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq uh, in years past. And its strategy is to allow regional players to take the lead, uh, and, and, and it will be supportive of any uh, efforts that the regional players are doing. Now, in this strategy, 
uh, one of the reasons why, in fact, a key reason why the United States wanted to get a nuclear deal is to basically remove a hurdle from the path of the United States to be able to work with Iran towards regional security. In other words, what I'm saying is that the nuclear issue was never really a critical issue. The issue was regional security, particularly Iraq and, of course, Syria, and the deal and how to defeat ISIS. And therefore, the, the Americans will continue to work with the Iranians. Now, obviously, that creates a problem because once the Americans are, uh, are working with the Iranians, uh, that upsets the Saudis. Um, uh, the Americans are trying to achieve a very uh, complex and difficult balance of power between the two sides. In fact, I would say that there are four players that the, uh, the Americans are trying to balance in the region. There's obviously Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, but there's also uh, Turkey and, and Israel. Those are the four powers of the region. And the United States are, is trying to ma maintain a balance, and a difficult one, and a delicate one, between the four players. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, while working with the Iranians, the uh, Americans also have to work with the Saudis. Uh, and we recently saw Secretary Kerry go to Saudi Arabia and meet with the leadership there and discuss their concerns about uh, I I Iranian uh, interference in their domestic affairs. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, while the Americans uh, will basically balance between the Iranians and the Saudis, they're going to rely heavily on the Turks because Turkey is the one power in the region uh, that can actually impose order uh, in places like Syria and Iraq should it make the political decision to do so. Uh, and I don't think it's a matter of if, it's the question is of when, because ultimately whether the Turks want to uh, engage in major, uh, major league geopolitics in the region, the objective ground realities and the threats emanating uh, from the fire that's burning on their southern flank in Syria is going to force the Turks to go in and, 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 and take charge of the situation. Uh, it's not going to be easy. But it's going to happen, and I think that the United States prefers that the Turks come in uh, because the, the, there are close relations between Washington and Ankara. Uh, the Turks are a fellow NATO ally, uh, and, and it, it, you know when you are out of options, uh, then you have to take the one that you know is the least bad. Uh, and so Turkey obviously has its problems. Uh, it sees the Kurds in Syria as a bigger threat, and the, and the Kurds obviously in, within their borders as a bigger threat than ISIS, and that uh, doesn't jive with American interests, but then, you know, you work with what you have, and I think that that's what the Americans are going to do. Russia, very quickly, is, uh, is not a major power in the region. Russian intervention in Syria was not necessarily to, because they, they want to protect Assad. That is a goal. But it is a goal uh, that is a subset of a wider objective, and that is to get a settlement on Ukraine. Uh, the Russians are not able to leverage the Syrian position uh, to get that settlement on Ukraine, but they're trying. And so and we have to look at Russian intervention in that light. Uh, then there's China. China is, is, especially now, with the economic crisis that they're suffering, uh, is going to have even less bandwidth uh, than before. And it's not like the Chinese had any ability to influence or shape events. Uh, it's a minor player compared even to Russia. So at, at the end of the day, uh, it's the United States, along with its European allies, that are going to shape the behavior of state actors in the region. Uh, but, at the, uh, but if there is going to be a lead role, that's going to have to come from uh, the regional players, uh, mostly Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, last question. What do you think is the solution to this problem? Then there is no quick solution, uh, I mean, to the conflict uh, or the conflicts, in, as in plural, uh, that are basically raging in the Middle East, uh, and the situation is getting compounded, uh, at, you know, day by day. And therefore, what we're looking at, you know, is a long-term conflict. It'll turn, it'll twist, it'll take, take new forms. Uh, some actors will, you know, become more assertive, others will become less assertive. Certain areas may become more uh, of a battle space than others. But the bottom line is that this conflict is with us uh, for a long time. And, and we're really looking at at least a generation, if not more, of conflict. That doesn't mean that there's going to be war, constant war, uh, you know, uh, in every country that's, that's currently on fire. Uh, 
Uh, but as a region, we're not looking at any solutions anytime soon. Uh, there are just too many players, too many stakeholders who have competing interests. Uh, we started off with a discussion of Iran and Saudi Arabia. Obviously, that geosectarianism that is brewing between them and raging right now uh, is going to be a key uh, ingredient that's going to continue and perpetuate conflict in the region. But then there's ISIS as well. Uh, there is the Kurdish issue. Uh, there is the issue of, you know, a collapse of autocratic regimes in the region, vacuums being created by uh, the meltdown of, of uh, state actors, and the rise of uh, non-state actors uh, who are trying to fill that vacuum. So, and there are no good arresters. I mean, I mentioned that Turkey is taking a lead role down the line. Uh, I do believe that will happen. But again, it's a long-term process, uh, and you know, the, the Turks will see themselves being involved in Syria and other places in the region uh, down the road uh, for a very long time. So there are no quick solutions or quick fixes. So I guess you know, to, to look at it from the bright, um, you know, in, in, on the bright side. You know, we just have to sit back and, you know, relax as much as possible and, and see what comes. Uh, thank you so much, Kamran Bukhari, for being on Tactical Talk. It was a pleasure having you. Hey, it's always a pleasure to be on the show. Thanks. This was Kamran Bukhari helping us understand the intensity of the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Until the next episode of Tactical Talk, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye.